Well, today's Father's Day. All the fathers have a happy Father's Day. Well, I wasn't really going to do a Father's Day message today, but it turned out different. <laughs> and it's, you know, you've heard me say this before, God tells you to do things and you're sitting here saying, okay, now exactly what do you want to do? And Kristen said, you need to do a message on such and such. And then God said, you need to do a message on this. And then it just totally amazed me what God ended up with this week. And then when he started out with it, it just went in so many directions. And I said, well, am I supposed to preach for the next two months on this message or just do what? So, fortunately, I got it down to just tonight. So we won't have to use this message for two months. <laughs> but it's kind of a lesson from a bad dad. And when we think of things, you know, most of us think, well, oh, boy, Taking lessons from a bad dad, that wouldn't be the way we want to think. But yet, sometimes we learn more from our mistakes or the mistakes of somebody else than we do from just doing it the way it's supposed to be or the one that's supposed to be the good example. Sometimes we see how somebody else does things wrong and we see It's just not right. And then we start to think, well, that's kind of the way I'm doing it. So we take a lesson from it. Well, this lesson that we have tonight from a bad dad comes from a fellow that was, he was a priest and he was a judge. And this happened about 2831 B.C. And it was right after the death of Samson. A fellow by the name of Eli, at the age of 58, had become the high priest and the judge of Israel. Now, the tabernacle of that particular day was located in the city of Shiloh. And Shiloh was in the northern part of what we know as, know as Israel. We, we often think of Jerusalem as the, the center of everything going on in Israel, but at this time, Shiloh was the center. That's where the tabernacle was. And, and Jerusalem didn't become the center of everything until about 90 years later. So Eli had two sons. And they served under him. And let's read 1 Samuel, the second chapter, verses 12 to 36, and we'll see how Eli failed, or how he was a bad dad. Samuel's over in there in the first part of the, the Bible. It's in the second 4,000, second 2,000 first 2,000 years ended about the 22nd chapter of Genesis. The next 4,000 years, 2,000 years went to the end of the Old Testament. Start at verse 12. It says, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, and while the meat was being boiled, the servant of the priest would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would plunge it into the pan or the kettle, or the cauldron, or the pot, and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned off, the servant of the priest would come and say, to the man who was sacrificed and give the priest's meat to, to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, only the raw. 
If the man said, hey, I want the fat be burned up first, then take whatever you want. And the servant would answer them, no hand it over. Now, if you don't, I'll take it by force. The sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing linen and bob. Each year his mother made him a robe and took it to him when she came up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless uh, Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take their place to the one that she prayed for and gave up to the Lord. Then they would go home. The Lord was gracious to Hannah, and she conceived and she gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now, Eli, who was very old, heard about everything that his sons were doing to all of Israel, and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours no my sons it's not good to report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people if a man sins against another man God may meditate for him but if a man sins against the Lord who will intercede for him his sons however did not listen to the father's view for it was the Lord that will put him to death and the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature in favor of the Lord and men. Then it goes into a prophecy against the house of Eli. It says, verse 27 says, Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your father's house when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your father out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest to go up to my altar to burn incense and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your father's house all the offerings made with fire by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offer that I'm prescribing for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than fatting yourself on choice parts? of every offering, offering made by the people of Israel. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your family line. And you'll see the distress in my dwelling, although good will be done to Israel. In your family line, there will never be an old man. Every one of you that I do not cut off from my altar will be spared, only to blind your eyes with the tears to grieve your heart. And all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons? Up night and Thymus will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will rise up myself, a fruitful, a faithful priest, who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his house, and he will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone in your family line will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a crust of bread and plead. Anoint me some priestly offering so I can have food to eat. He just said, I hear that you're doing it. 
Then another thing that we find in this scripture was that everything belongs to God. It's only on loan to us. We have it for a short while, no matter what we are. It's only on loan. The house we live in, no matter how many payments we make on it, when we leave this world, we won't take it with us. It's just one money. So we'll find that out in this lesson today. And the third thing is that God has to sometimes step in and take care of things. Sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes we don't pay attention. Sometimes we just don't do anything. We don't care. And God has to step in and get our attention. The unfortunate thing is, Eli didn't listen long enough or enough to pay attention. So what was the big deal? What were, first of all, what were the boys doing? When the sacrifice was made, it was a blood offering. And it wasn't a blemish. You didn't take the lamb or a dove or whatever to be sacrificed. You didn't take one with a rough leg. You took the best one of the whole bunch. Well, if you went to the stockyard, you picked out what you thought was the perfect lamb. And you took it and offered it for the sacrifice. Once they shed the blood of the lamb, they took the meat and they boiled it. And the idea was, is when you boil all of the oil, they considered that to be the fat. It was a lot healthier when you boil and burn off what they call the fat. But that wasn't what Eli's boys were doing. They wanted it raw. They wanted to roast it. I suppose they wanted the juicy fat. But that's what they were doing. They were taking the absolute very best of the meat for themselves. Now if a traveler were coming through from some other part of the country and come to the tabernacle to pray, they would be given food. Some of the leftover cooked down food. But in this case, the boys were taking the best. And not only that, the women that worked and tended things outside the temple or the tabernacle were being seduced by the boys. So they were totally out of control. And Eli did very little to protect them. Now, Eli taught treasure from God. Hannah had been to the, to the tabernacle. She'd been praying. In previous scripture ahead of what I read, she had been praying that God would give her a son. The husband had two wives, the other wife was being very fruitful. She had children, and Hannah was sitting there saying, Oh, Lord, give me a child. Eli goes over and says, Woman, are you drunk? She says, No, I'm talking to God. I've asked him for a child, I've been there, and I should have had one of them. I want a son. Eli told her, says, God hears your prayer if you're going home. And she went, and within a year she had had the son was born. And as soon as that son was weaned, she brought that son back to the tabernacle. And she said, train him up, teach him. God loaned him to me. God blessed me with this son. I want to give him back to God that he can do for God. So Eli, instead of doing what he did with his boys, he actually seemed to be a pretty good father and father figure and trainer for this gentleman named Samuel, the son that Hannah gave to Eli. Because all the way through everything, Samuel had assisted Eli. He did everything that he was supposed to do. And his mother would make him a new linen ephod. And that's this white linen garment that the priest wore. The high priest, his was decorated with 12, 12 stones that was embroidered into the, to the uh, ephod. 
and that was to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. But only the high priest, the rest of them was proclaimed Levi. Anyway, Mom made him a new one. Every year he was bigger and he was growing taller, so she would come out every year and make, make a new one. And because God had, or she had given back to God, she was blessed with three more sons and two more daughters. You know, we work hard for the possessions that we've got. But we should never lay claim to them and say they're not God's. God didn't give them to us. And she recognized that point and says, God, I want you to have this boy back. He's a good boy. Now, Eli had received the warning from God. He said, things aren't going good. He said, you're going to be the only old man in the whole family. Everybody else is going to have a premature death. It's going to happen faster than you would expect it to. They're going to drop dead. They're not going to be old. He says, I'll raise up a priest that's going to be faithful. He's going to serve me and do what I ask him to do. Look at 1 Samuel again. And look at uh, chapter 4 and verses 12 to 18. Let's see what happened to Eli and his family. Starting in verse 12. That same day a Benjaminite ran from the battle line. Maybe I'll back up and start a little bit here from that. Israel was in war with the Philistines. They had battled. They weren't doing good. So they said, let's take God with us to battle. So the two younger priests, the two sons of Eli, took the Ark of the Covenant, went into battle. Start at 12. That same day, Benjaminite ran from the battle line and he went to Shiloh. His clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and he asked, What's the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes were set so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, What happened to my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. The ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. He had led Israel for 40 years. When you look this heavy up in commentary, it says that Eli, Eli and his boys were fat. They had eaten so much that they were just fat. God's not in the business of taking lives for punishment. But sometimes things get so big, so bad, that God has to say, enough's enough. Eli was a bad dad. He had a great amount of difficulty when it comes to disciplining his sons. He wasn't just a father that failed as a dad. He failed as a priest because he didn't discipline his sons and their attitudes. And the standard practice would have been for him and what they were doing would have been having the sons put to death. That would have been the standard practice if you had a priest under you that was doing the things that they were doing. Those priests would have been put to death. 
what he did with they were his boys. And I think since he was fat, and the Bible says that the boys were fat, he was joining in with them and what they ate. Eli, he allowed sin blacks to happen in the tabernacle. And I think that he became guilty in the eyes of God. You know, whether we're at home or whether we're at work, and I know that everybody has seen something happen that wasn't right. You know, when we're working, we see, uh, what was that movie, uh, was it Courageous, where the fellows was, that the uh, fellow went in to him. Uh, the boss is asking about taking this job, but we want you to say you got this much when you only got this much, or hide one back or something. And he goes back the next day and he says, I said, I can't do it. I just can't do it. My God wouldn't let me lie. And he said he was the first person in a great number that had come in for interviews that was willing to be truthful, and that's what we need. You've got the job. And he thought he was going to get fired for saying, I can't do it. Sometimes we need to take a stand that we don't take. Sometimes as parents, we allow our children to do things that only cause them greater damage. Well, I'd rather not start a ruckus. I'd rather not stir something up. I'd rather not fuss. I'm not one for confrontation. And so we let things slide, and then it gets out of hand. Eli failed in the eyes of God. When we fail in the eyes of God, we become a bad dad as fathers or a bad parent. But when I was doing this message, God showed me something else in this. Man, I just couldn't imagine how the comparison just a bit so. But I got to thinking about the way the country was being run. And the things in the last couple of weeks that's popped up over the this group or that group or the IRS doing something and everybody says, well, we didn't know they were doing that. Or they're collecting data on somebody here or collecting data on somebody there. Well, if you looked at Eli, he was the head honcho. He was the judge. He was the high priest. Would our president not be the high priest or the judge? Would he not be responsible for his people he put in office in the same way? Would his responsibility not be to take care of that, not leave it to somebody else to deal with? I thought that was strange to see that. I saw a news article. It was on CNN last week, and I missed catching work was wrong. But I watched a little video clip, and here's his father being interviewed on the front steps of the courthouse. He had just been in the court, and the social services department had had him there for child support. And the judge read off so and so versus so and so and so and so versus so and so, and he kept on like that down about I don't know how many. And and this guy was 33 years old. He had fathered 22 children by 14 different women. And I think this was New York. I just can't remember where it was. And I can't remember the exact figure. But the state is paying seventy-five hundred and odd dollars in support to fourteen mothers for his twenty-two children. That's a bad day. We've got fathers in this country that's walking off from their families every day because they're a bad dad. They don't have the responsibility. I had a fellow come to my high school one time who was a visitor, and this was a bunch of years ago, probably 25 years ago. He was a friend of my daughter's, 
and, and my daughter's poetry. And this guy wasn't a poetry friend. And he came out of the house and he was talking about his wife was in the service and she was pregnant and his girlfriend was pregnant too. And I said, how do you explain that? And he said, the same way the other two kids. I said, well, who's going to support these kids? He said, that's their problem they had. That's a bad dad. That's the attitude. And that's almost what Eli was doing. Eli was saying, well, this isn't right. And how many times do we as parents or as leaders say, well, that's not right, but we don't do anything about it? And that's what happened to Leo. God had to take charge and take care of it. There's thousands of families in our country right now that's got bad dads. They don't even have dads that say you're not doing right. They got dads that don't even show up. We've got thousands of children right here in the area that don't have a clue who their dad is. We as Christians need to pray for those kids and for the dads that God has straightened it all out. We need to pray for our country that our leadership can be a dad. When we stop and pray, Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. Why couldn't we say, Dad, I'm here again? And that's the way we ought to treat God. Our dad, who are in heaven. He looks after us just like a dad. And we should have a relationship with him. Like we would our own dad. We can say, I'm the oldest dad in the room. My kids is raised and gone. I don't care how old you get as a dad. You're still dad. You're still father. And you still got a job to do. Just because they went out the door don't mean you're done. We childproof the high school kid. You've got to be a dad. And how about God? full of stories where his chosen people of Israel turned away and fell short of the things that he expected them to do. We do the best we can. God did the best that he could do to raise the children of Israel. We're not perfect. I beat myself up at times when my kids didn't do exactly what I thought they should do. But we've got to know that we did the best we could. You've heard that old saying, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. You can take a child and you can train him up in the ways that he should go. And the Bible says when he grows old, he'll not depart from him. The prodigal son left home to go out and find his place in the world. When he found out it didn't work, he come back to the Father. We've got to teach him. We've got to be there for him. God punished the children of Israel when they failed. When we had small kids, we punished them when they failed.
He thought it was a bad day. Maybe he thought he loved his sons and didn't want to scold. Maybe he just didn't know how to do things. But he had a responsibility. And Father, we as parents, as fathers, we have a responsibility to look after our children. Father God, I don't think there's ever a time when we don't stop worrying or stop caring for them. And Father, we thank you that you've instilled in us that desire, that need to look after our children. Father, we pray that you'll speak to those that are forgetting their children or walking away that have no understanding of what Father is. Father God, today we just thank you that we can understand and we can relate to the fact that you're a father too. We thank you for your son Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank everybody for coming. And, uh, see everybody next Sunday. Uh, they said it was supposed to get nasty storms tonight, so be careful. And uh, maybe some nasty storms tomorrow. We were very blessed this past week that we didn't have nasty storms. They said Salem and Runnick was trash worse than it did last summer when we got the break out. And so uh, some areas were hit pretty hard. And, as nasty as all that storm come through, um, God only took one four-year-old child down in Georgia. So uh, he spared us big for what they said was coming with those storms. I think it was everybody here was praying that they didn't have it. Or as bad as it was calling. We'll see everybody next week.